Okay, so I want to talk about Sorrows of Young Goethe by Goethe, and I think it's a brilliant book. It's a wonderful piece of work. Uh, it was written when he was only 24. It caused this extraordinary amount of controversy. Uh, there was this phenomenon, supposedly during the time, right, called Goethe mania, where apparently people, you know, they would dress like him. Uh, you know, you, there was like a whole franchise, basically, of Goethe stuff. Uh, you know, there wasn't a copyright sort of thing back then, so a lot of people could reproduce copies, could create clothes, merchandise, etc. They put them on coffee mugs and so forth um, without uh, Goethe getting any of the licensing, the author, right? Didn't get any of the licensing. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, content already uh, summarizing the plot, giving a basic sense of what the story is and situating it a little bit inside the historical context. So I thought I would try to do something a little bit richer and a little bit deeper. Um, and uh, in the link below, or I mean in the description below rather, you're going to find a link to a really great summary of the book uh, because other people again have already done really good jobs. And so I feel like I should uh, share the views with someone else as well. And so check that out if you need a summary of the book. I'm assuming you've come here because you've already read it. Um, and so, Sorrows of Young Goethe, some of the stuff I want to talk about are the literary devices employed, which I think uh, is really interesting, right? Like, I, I think there's something really singular and unique. Now, now, Goethe is not the first epistolary novel, and what I mean by epistolary novel is it's a novel told in letters, right? Uh, so you can see uh, Samuel Richardson uh, did this before uh, an English novelist, uh, Rousseau did this before Goethe. Did um, there were so there are a number of writers who who did employ this form, but Goethe actually does it in a way that's completely unique. Because so in, in addition to the the novel being structured as letters from Goethe, the protagonist, to other people, right, to his friend Wilhelm, to Lotte, um, who's his love interest. Uh, so he he has these letters to different people. The thing is, there's an editor that actually is overseeing. He says, you know, I've collected everything I could about uh, this sad case or whatever at the beginning of the book. And so, and what he's referring to is uh, Werther's, spoiler, spoiler alert, right? Uh, but what he's referring to is Werther's suicide at the end of the book. The whole book is a saga of a suicide. And so this person, this editor, right, this fictional editor uh, is trying to put together the evidence to sort of determine why this very troubled, very sensitive soul took his own life. And so he, he said, you know, I've, I've collected all the evidence. But what's so interesting is Werther, um, we see all his letters to other people, but we don't see any of the letters of the other people to him. And uh, so he consigns, at the very end, he consigns a bunch of texts to the fire. He mentions this in a letter. He mentions his own diary, right? But we never see a page, not a word of that diary. And so what we're assuming is that Werther, the protagonist, actually took all of the things that other people wrote to him and threw them away. Right? And so all we have is this one sided, this lopsided correspondence. And so it creates, it's structurally, it's really interesting, right? Because this is the story of, of the slow, um, slow dissolution of, of a person's psyche. And, and, and this psyche goes from, from, he seems to be delighted at almost everything, right? And, and, and he becomes in love, he falls in love, and he's filled with love, and the world is beautiful. And then in the second half of the book, you know, it's divided into two parts. And the second half of the book, everything that he found beautiful in the first half becomes uh, horrifying, right? The very same symbols, some of them, uh, take on a more, uh, a more unpleasant and at times like really baleful cast. Basically, like as a, as a document, right? And structurally, the fact that we only have that one side of the letter and the fact that it's about a suicide is, is we get to see it's, it's a, a way of very explicitly demonstrating the loneliness of this protagonist, right? It's, it's like it, all this guy lives in is this echo chamber of his own thoughts and emotions and miseries. Because instead of, you, you know, there's this, there's this idea that so much of mental illness and so much of suicide and so much of this sort of disorder, right, has to do with a, a lack of capacity to communicate with the outside world. There's this almost impassable gulf between uh, someone that, that is so afflicted as Werther is and, and other people. Other people can't reach him, right? And all we see is, this, is the interior bubble of this person that becomes more and more and more and more 
um, degraded and disordered. And um, it's been said by a number of critics that Werther is the first truly psychological novel. And I think that's a fair assertion. The first psychological novel, what do we mean by that? Because, um, you know, with the exception of those those passages from the narrator, which are very brief at the beginning, they get a little longer in the end. But besides that, we are entirely locked in the psyche of our narrator. And the narrator sees the world in what becomes more and more apparently a skewed way. Um, and right now, I'd like to take a chance to talk about this structure, like this book one to book two structure. <clears throat> because in book one, in general, um, Werther is happy until the arrival of Albert, right? Her, uh, Lotta's fiance. But he's generally happy. He's filled with love for her. And there's even kind of a, a happy uh, relationship between the three of them. He doesn't loathe Albert. Rather, he... Um, well, there are two versions of the book. And he sort of has a disdain for Albert more in the first one. But in the second one, especially... Pardon me one second. My cat is chewing some styrofoam. And I have to fix that. No! No, Jesus! No, angel. No, angel. Sorry about that. Okay. In, so there are two versions of the book. And in the first version, he does show a measure of disdain for Albert. But in the second one, it's really not as explicit. And he actually sees, um, he sees himself as being at fault, um, in the, especially in the second part of the book, right? Uh, uh, Werther is, is tormented by his own desire, a desire that controls him and not the other way around. Um, and yet he begins to justify his need to be with Lotte um, and to lament his state. But so these two parts of the book, right? So in book one, for example, uh, Vota meets this farmhand and he's all, all the time, he's condescendingly praising the common folk, you know, the people who aren't lettered, who aren't educated, who don't, um, who don't live in high society, but rather they're, they're the peasant types. And he says, oh, they have a much more uh, real and alive view of the world than these people that are constrained by the strictures of society, especially high society. Um, and he despises this high society, and this high society, in turn, despises him. It's, it's, a, it's a mutual antipathy, for sure. But the, So he meets this farmhand who's in love with the woman that he serves. And uh, so he admires him and he admires his, the farmhand's love for this, for this woman that he works for because he sees in him a mirror of himself. But see, in, in, in part two, he sees the farmhand again and the farmhand actually kills a uh, rival suitor for this woman. This woman's affections uh, move towards this other guy and the farmhand, driven mad, actually kills this person and then is arrested um, and and Vota actually comes to his defense much uh, to the uh, consternation of the other people in the in the place where he lives because they all see him as guilty and and Vota's attempts to justify him not only betray his feelings for Lota I think in the mind especially of someone like Albert um, Lota's uh, fiance and later husband but they, they also show that Vota, his state is disordered. And I think other people see that. And even from the, you know, the myopic view that uh, the letters provide us, uh, we, we also sort of get that indication. Another great example of this use of the same symbol in a different way in part one and part two is the tree. There's this tree that Vota adores in the first uh, part of the book. And the pastor who and his wife who tend it, um, he spends a lot of time talking about his admiration for them. Then the pastor's wife dies. The new wife, he finds to be a cold and unkind person. He doesn't like her theology. He doesn't like her view of religion, which he finds to be unspiritual. It leans more toward a scientific and materialistic worldview. And corresponding to that, this woman chooses to cut down the tree and she pisses off the whole town uh, as she does this. The whole landscape in part two of Verta is one of death and of madness and of unpleasantness. There are so many ways to talk about how one can read this book. Uh, when it was initially released, it, it caused 
extraordinary co controversy, that vertomania that I talked about to begin with, there are stories, and apparently they're not true, but there are stories of a number of copycat suicides that came as the result of unstable persons reading Verta and then killing themselves. But this, in fact, apparently ha did not happen, or at least not in the way that uh, it is that people used to believe it did. Um, however, the story itself is based on a suicide um, of, of an associate of Goethe's, of someone that he knew. And almost every figure in the novel is based on a real person. However, their, their actual relations to him and to the main character are considerably altered. And it actually upset many of the real personages in the book and through correspondence, etc. Um, Goethe actually, he changed, for example, the Albert character. Um, he softened Goethe's view of this character in consideration for the feelings of the person upon whom it was based. Um, but regardless, the, the reaction, that initial reaction to Goethe was... Uh, a furious one. There were there were people who uh, staunchly defended it, and there were people who condemned it outright. And it's because it was such a different and unusual book. So, the condemnation uh, derived mainly because they thought of it as a justification for suicide. First of all, that that the the book rises to such emotional heights, and a reader who's not careful, who's not really trained in how to understand literary devices might see the voice of the narrator or the protagonist for being the voice of the author. That, that, that the opinions uh, articulated by Goethe would actually be Goethe's, which is not at all the case. Um, even though Goethe himself said something to the effect that, you know, there's not a single young person ever who hasn't felt like Verta has at some point, but that doesn't mean that it's a celebration of suicide, and especially if you see the way that Verta dies, um, that becomes very clear. First of all, Verta dies in agony, he shoots himself in the head, and then he spends hours dying. It's not a quick and easy thing. Um, he's, you know, they find him and they put him on the bed, and people come visit him. And it's a mess, and he's gasping, and he's bleeding, and it's ugly, and it causes a bunch of misery for everybody. And then the last line of the book is, no priest attended. Vota, who actually compares himself to Christ, who sees his suicide as a form of sacrifice so that Lota and Albert can finally be happy, um, so he sees his deed as selfless, and yet, at the very end, he says to Lota, we're going to be together again. He keeps promising. He says, oh, God is going to unite us. So whatever it is in terms of sacrifice, it doesn't really seem to be a sacrifice, really. And, and I think um, in the narrative, this is, or in the narrative um, and by the editor, this is made quite clear that, that Vertus' state is a disordered one. His, his mindset and his reasoning are completely compromised by his, his delusional and obsessive uh, love for Lota. And so, so first, he thinks they're going to be together again. He thinks God is going to bring them together again in the afterlife. Um, and so what, it's re what he's really doing is escaping from the painful reality of the social strictures that he rebels against. Because even when he gets a job as a civil servant, for example, he doesn't do well, he has to quit. He doesn't adjust well as an adult. He's not able to put his emotions in order and function as an adult. And, and instead, he throws all of his effort and energy into loving a woman who cannot, because of the fact that she's engaged and then married to another man, who cannot uh, reply to his affections in kind without committing what everyone in the book considers, Verte included, to be a grievous sin. And so I think that as a justification for suicide, that argument is unfair. Now, its, its defenders, on the other hand, thought that it was, and, and rightly so, thought that it was a truly singular work of art because it so unrelentingly and unflinchingly portrayed that kind of disorder and because it made us feel so deeply for someone that was in a kind of impossible bind. And they also thought that that what really should justify a work of art was not its social good, but its aesthetic merit, which Verta has in, in spades. Uh, now, in my view, what, what I find most profound about the book, and I don't think that this is what Goethe intended necessarily, but I see it as a 
as almost a deeply moral book because it's a critique to me what what i feel uh, intentionally or otherwise i read it as a critique of allowing oneself of this disordered state of this seeding of authority of uh, of one's reason to emotion and it, it's not that Werther does this intentionally so maybe critique is the wrong word um but it's very clear, and I think we've all been in that situation where we've been in love with someone that didn't reply in kind to our affections. Um, but this idea of being consumed with love or with lust or with greed or anything, when our emotions take the wheel instead of our reason, um, directing our emotions. You know, um, every episode of My 600 Pound Life or To Catch a Predator shows people whose lower impulses. Um, actually take precedence over their reasoning capacity. Every one of them, right? And these people are, in a sense, in the same spot because they're enslaved to parts of themselves over which they apparently have no control and parts that direct their person to disordered um, and ultimately destructive ends. Every drug addict in the world has the exact same experience. And I think we've all had that experience in, in, to one degree or another. And I think that's what's so profound and what's so lasting. Why Vöta is an enduring work of art? Because it is a chronicle um, and a very clear, a very articulate, very poignant chronicle of that kind of disorder. And I, I could not recommend it uh, more strongly 